welcome to the Pat Dale Investment Podcast again. I'm Callum Newman, and we've got a big old show for you this week. We're going to talk uh, three things specifically. We're going to talk about income ideas um, that I've been seeing and watching on the ASX going through the company announcements, as I always do. Talk a little bit about Will Smith, the great Will Smith, the movie star, and his new book and some reflections he has on wealth and maybe something to give you a bit of a laugh as well. And then, of course, we're going to have the first lady of Australian Precious Metals, my old mate Shay Russell, on the show. He's going to tell us about her new role. So she left Fat Tail Media to go to a major Australian gold player um, and some uh, of her insights on what's happening with gold, gold stocks, um, and the gold industry from a slightly different angle to Brian that we had on the other week. Firstly, to begin, um, I cover the property sector. I've told you that before. One way to get income in the property sector is via what's called the Real Estate Investment Trust, so the REITs. And these guys bundle up a bunch of properties, whether it's offices, self-storage, shopping malls, uh, towers, whatever. And then they collect the income, deduct their costs, and then they pay out the, the rest as income. So if you are looking for income, there are still options here, um, but they all got smashed in the COVID collapse like everything else. Some of them have come back faster than others. So logistics, for example, is driving industrial property uh, bananas. So that has been bid up already. So it's it's hard to find good value there in that sector, though it is growing very fast. Um, the kind of malls anchored by supermarkets are, are very popular as well because you know it's become apparent that they're very secure, even the COVID collapse. So one area that's still potentially good value is the office sector. Now, there's still the great debate whether offices are going to be needed, going to be work from home. I have my own studio here, for example. I can do it from home. I don't need an office, but that's not true of everybody. And it's not true of every company. I just thought it was interesting that a company called Centuria Office Read came out this morning with their update for December. Um, now, with REITs, they revalue their property, well, I should say value, uh, up or down their property holdings, depending on what happens. And this particular one has booked a valuation uplift. Now, that was interesting to me because, as I said, we have this debate about offices. And as far as their value is concerned, their office uh, assets have gone up in value. And they've got a very big yield on them at the moment, this particular one. Now, I'll put a disclaimer on it, but I haven't done uh, due diligence on this particular stock, but it has a 7% yield. Now that's not that's high actually. I, there's a couple of other REITs I follow that pay around five to six percent. Not all in offices; some of them are, uh, you know, medical and, and that type of thing as well. But five, six, seven percent shows you there's a lot of income potential uh, in the REIT sector when you look at bank deposits at zero and, and bonds paying uh, negative rates after inflation. So that Centuria one is not the only one out there, but certainly. Um, there are income options in the REIT sector on the ASX. So that's one idea for you. And you mentioned uh, in our first podcast, I said uh, Rio was a contrarian buy at the time and the overall iron ore sector, iron ore sector rather, pays very high uh, dividends as well. And thus far, that idea has played out okay. I mean, Rio hasn't boomed, but it's, it, it, it has held up through a, since that point. A very difficult period for the market, and it's shaping up to to, to pay out a reasonable uh, yield. Um, and the fear about China's property collapsing has has started to fade, which I thought it would do. So keep an eye on that sector there also. And just by way of example of that, the iron ore industry is still very profitable. There's a smaller iron ore company that nobody really knows called Grange Resources, much smaller than Rio and all, and all those ones, but. It operates down in Tassie. On Friday, they came out with a special 10, 10 cent a share uh, dividend. Uh, now, the stock only trades for around what did before the announcement at 60 cents. So it was a very high uh, payout ratio, uh, considering it already going to pay four cents for the, for the year so far, anyway. Uh, and that to me just shows you that iron ore is still very profitable when it's $100 a ton even though it's not $200 a tonne, which was the extreme high back in, in mid-year. And even now, iron ore is, is trading around, uh, I went back over five years of Rio reports, $100 is, is better than the previous five years average uh, from 2017, 18, 19, 20, et cetera. So it's, it's still 
oddly enough, considering all that we've gone through in the last few months, uh, very profitable for those that produce it. Now, so income ideas. To sum up there, REITs, iron ore, still interesting to me. Um, now we're going to turn to my new best buddy. If you can see this, if you're watching it, it's Will Smith, the, the guru of Independence Day and uh, Men in Black, uh, hip-hop artist, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, just wrote his memoir. It's a ripping book. I ripped through it in a couple of days. Uh, he's a great writer, it turns out, as well. So he's just one ridiculously talented man. So here's a, I'm going to read you a funny little anecdote, and then I'll talk to you about what he concludes about being super rich and famous. But here's, this is before he was super rich and famous. So just a background to the, to the anecdote, he meets a girl, he falls in love. She's a Muslim, um, I guess from a strict household, I can't remember now, but uh, for some reason she has a falling out with her family and she needs to stay at his place. Uh, so this is Will Smith on, on what happens. I had already promised my mother no sex. Melanie would stay in the basement. I would sleep in my room two floors up. It was only temporary. Daddy-O protested, but mum-mum won this one. I'm still not exactly sure why I did what I did that day. To this day, I have no idea what I was thinking. Of all the experiences I am sharing in this book, this is the individual moment of personal behaviour that makes the least sense to me. Before I reveal what happened, I would like to preface my remarks by making it unequivocally clear that I was deeply and totally in love with Melanie Parker. We were going to be married. We were going to have four beautiful uh, children and our union would live alongside the epic tales of romance, Romeo and Juliet, Tristan and uh, Isult, Tupac and Janet, even Eddie and Holly in Boomerang. But at 4 a.m., less than three months into our star-crossed love affair, Mum Mum should have been asleep but tragically decided she wanted a cup of coffee. And wearing slippers far too quiet to defend her delicate sensibilities, she approached the threshold of the family kitchen Still innocent, she flipped the light switch as she had done tens of thousands of times before. By this time, her eyes landed upon her eldest son and his girlfriend deep in the throes of reckless lovemaking. As a teenager, outside of physical injury, you cannot feel worse than having your mother catch you and your girlfriend doggy style on her kitchen floor. Oh, Willard, my mum growled. <laughs> so I thought that was a little bit on the... Funny side there from, uh, from the great man. But more seriously, I wanted to tell you about his reflections. So he goes on to become the mo biggest movie star in the world and incredibly rich, hundreds of millions of dollars, millions of records uh, sold. And he still found at the end of all that that he carried a lot of discontent and that his family had some problems and, and his wife wasn't happy and all sorts of things. So here's him just reflecting a little bit about that, where he, he says uh, much later on, I started to recognize the game, the trick, the insanity, the carrot on the stick. I had never liked vampire movies, but I suddenly understood their mythology. They are a metaphor for insatiable human hunger, unquenchable thirst and chronic dissatisfaction, the attempt to fill a spiritual hole with external things. Now, the reason I put that out is there because Towards the end of the book, he basically books himself into therapy and, and sort of admits that even with all the money and all the houses and the glamour and, the, and all, the, all that type of thing that he, he, he had, was in a place that he wasn't, wasn't happy with and he felt he cited his grandma, actually, who lived very simply, but she'd always had uh, lived with gratitude and uh, she was religious and this type of thing. And, and she, she was happy and, and he was like, well, why <laughs> like grandma? I've got all this fame and stuff. And uh, so he sort of concludes that material things don't take you there and, and that it's a bit of a fool's gold. So I thought that was interesting, whether he's right or not. I don't know. I'll never be Will Smith, but um, I just thought that was interesting when you see someone with that kind of success and, and money sort of put it aside and say, well, actually maybe it's not all that what it's cracked up to be. So I'll leave you with those two very different thoughts from Will Smith. <laughs> and now we bring on the first lady of Australian precious metals, my old mate, Shay Russell. Here she is, the first lady of Australian precious metals, Shay Russell, my old desk buddy. Um, by way of background, Shay covered the gold industry for Fat Tail Media for like 10 years, um, from 2010 roughly to 2020. 
She decided to get a different angle on the gold industry. So she's going to tell us a little bit about where she's gone and what she's been doing and thoughts on gold, etc. So Shay, where did you go and what have you been doing? Hello, Callum. It is fantastic to see you again. I do miss my uh, desk buddy and some of those very long market conversations we used to have. So hopefully today we'll bring some of that essence back. Yes. Um, so quick update on where I've gone. Look, basically, I couldn't get close enough to the gold. So I have gone to work as the group communications manager for Pallion, which is actually the parent company of uh, ABC Bullion and ABC Refinery. Uh, and obviously, my job is to, for lack of a better way of putting it, help spread the word about precious metals. So when you say ABC Bullion, if people don't follow precious metals, that's like one of the big gold dealers, right? So if you want to buy a gold bar, a gold coin, you would go and see you guys. Yeah, pretty much. So um, ABC Bullion is Australia's, uh, Australasia, Australasia's actually, uh, Australasia's largest independent privately owned uh, precious metal bullion dealer and refinery. Uh, so we've got basically all the accreditations that people should look for when it comes to buying precious metals. So we're authorised for gold and silver by the London Bullion Market Association. We've got, um, we're good for delivery on uh, uh, for CME Group. So that's, when I say good for delivery, it is uh, the good for delivery for uh, settlement for golden future silver contracts on the futures. I have really stuffed up getting that out. I do apologize for being tongue tied. It is really hot in Melbourne today. Um, so that's sort of like our back end. So we're not um, a small company. We're actually quite a big company. And we also have international accreditation, which basically means our bullion is accepted anywhere in the world. All right, all right, nice sales pitch. Now, I just want to say <laughs> that there is no relationship between Fat Tail Media and ABC Bullion. It's not one, not. Of the, not one of those dodgy deals on the table. You're just a mate of mine, but that's what you're doing now. Um, so you don't have anything to do with gold shares anymore. Like, no, not you personally, but as a company, ABC Bullion, it's just the physical stuff. Yeah, so I basically just stick to physical at the moment. And essentially uh, what I do over here is I'm trying to bridge the gap between institutional knowledge and retail knowledge. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of things that happen on the institutional side of the gold market that people don't uh, really understand how that helps, uh, you know, uh, what happens there and how that impacts the gold price. Um, uh, so I'm trying to take that knowledge to the retail audience. Uh, but also, too, I believe that everybody should own a small portion of their wealth in precious metals. You know, I, I own physical gold and silver, so I'm certainly talking my own book. Um, and a lot of part of my role here is to uh, encourage people to understand why owning gold and silver is, a, a, is important as a small part of your portfolio. Well, it's funny you say that because, you know, I used to poo-poo gold a bit and you go, no, 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 you got to buy the stocks and it's going to do this, it's going to do that. And then it had like this massive bull run and uh, I missed a lot of it. Um, then I started to get a little bit enthusiastic about gold shares and they've done Nothing but give me grief this year. They look good and they went down and they look good and they went down again. Are you still following the shares and what's going on with gold? Oh, look, I'm absolutely uh, a private investor in precious metal stocks. Like that hasn't changed as well as commodity stocks. Uh, you know, I am studying geology part time. So I'm a rock nerd first and foremost. I've forgotten um, about that. Yeah, we'll talk yeah. about that in a sec. Yeah. Oh, well, look, oh my God, a, a chance to talk about rocks. I've even got some for show and tell behind me if you'll indulge me. Okay. Um, <laughs> Can I see the gold, brother? <laughs> Actually, it does have the tiniest speck of gold in them. It's my precious rock. Um, so basically, what I'm doing at the moment is a professional. Professionally, I mostly speak about just uh, precious metal investments and I tend to steer away about commenting on mining shares for the moment. So, but so what's going on with gold? Like, do you tell people that it's a, an inflation hedge, it's a chaos hedge, it's a hard asset, it's a, it's a diversifier, it's non-correlated? What, what's your argument for holding gold? Believe it or not, my argument for holding gold is all of the above. And that's going to sound like a cop out, but it's actually not. Uh, and I'm leaning on a little bit of something that Jim Rickards has written about extensively. And I know he's a friend of Fat Tail Media. Uh, he's written extensively about this over the years, how gold is a chameleon. Uh, and gold's performance reflects very much what's happening in the market. So sometimes gold behaves like a commodity. And that's where you won't see a lot of exciting price action. And other times gold behaves like a monetary asset. And that's when you do see those extreme moves. And that's because gold is reflecting uh, stress in the financial system. So the reasons for holding gold are basically it's about having a diversified asset portfolio that allows you to have exposure to, you know, the chaos, the chaos argument, the inflation argument, the deflation argument, as well as times that, you know, gold and silver, for example, can um, have a subdued performance when, you know, stocks are running hot. So it really is all of the above, but that is just because gold can do many, many things. And so I was so there's always the added complication with 
Australia that you get the influence of the Aussie dollar. So even though US dollar gold hasn't done that much, Aussie dollar gold's actually been really great over the last 10 years because it's gone down basically. Was, gold didn't have to do anything and it, it went up in Aussie dollars. Look, that's probably one of the most exciting things I've written about this week, especially to uh, clients of ABC Bullion talking about the benefit of finding that sweet spot, the sweet spot, sweet spot. Oh, this is going real well. Sweet spot <laughs> between the Australian dollar gold price and the US um, and the US dollar gold price, and this is where the volatility of the Aussie dollar comes into it. So often, when you've got a subdued um, gold price, the Aussie dollar can be your friend from an entry and exit point. So, oh God, I hate talking about currencies off the top of my head. I normally like to write them down, but basically when the Australian dollar is weak, it sort of offsets any of the gold movements. But when the Australian dollar is quite strong and the Aussie, uh, the US dollar gold price isn't doing very well, that can often provide a great time to buy in because basically it's softening, you know, it's, it's yep. muting any movements in there, but it's creating a cheaper entry price for people to in, move into precious metals. So when you're talking to, I guess you have some sort of conversation with the miners, right? They're your raw material suppliers. Like how are they feeling about the gold industry right now in Australia? We hear like they've got a labour shortage in the WA, but they're still making lots of money. Uh, but I know there's issues around like grade and uh, diesel. And what's your vibe from what's going on at the, I was going to say the coal face, the gold face. The gold, the gold face. Look, I was, um, you've got me at a great time. So I'm fresh off the back from the Melbourne Mining Club on Thursday last week, uh, where I was a guest of Kirkland Lake. Um, as anybody knows, you know, you're not supposed to have favourites, but I absolutely love the Fosterville story that's happening out in Victoria. Uh, and it is, look, I started writing about the issues facing, like the labour shortage facing gold miners uh, last year when I was with Fat Tail Media, and that hasn't gone anywhere. If anything, it's actually getting worse. Uh, there is uh, discontent among the ranks in WA as some the WA government is mandating, obviously, vaccines. Uh, now, obviously, I don't want to wade into those waters now, but there, there, you know, there's questions about what sort of stresses are going to be placed on uh, labour and staffing if they uh, these mandates are coming in in WA. There's like there's nothing that can change it. So there are questions about are there going to be further staffing pressures in mines as some people uh, some parties uh, may refuse to take them. Uh, however, with immigration set to opening up, I guess there's some sort of optimism that they'll be able to bring some staff back through, assuming WA, of course, actually open their borders because uh, Mr McGowan has been quite reluctant to put hard deadlines on when those borders are going to open. So the staffing shortages are still very much impacting WA. Uh, and also too, like we're seeing a similar sort of thing in Victoria, New South Wales and Northern Territory, not as bad, but it, um, you know, without stronger immigration in the mining sector, there is staffing shortages there. The salaries being offered in the mining sector are very high at the moment. In fact, um, if, uh, <sighs> They're, look, they're definitely putting pressure on margins, but because of the labour shortage, uh, I can tell some stories about miners that have thrown increasingly large numbers at very young staff members just to try and attract them to their site. Now, obviously, uh, these are going to impact margins, and this is something that I can't remember which company wrote about it, whether it was the um, World Gold Council or Metals Focus wrote a really detailed report about high labour costs are actually starting to impact gold miners' margins around the world. So we're certainly seeing margins, um, the mining margins come under pressure. Uh, the only upside there is that some of the grades are marginally high, like uh, globally speaking, I haven't got the details for Australia in front of me, but globally speaking, the grade did increase by 0.5% over 2021. So when you're talking about this mining conference, where did precious metals rank in like the enthusiasm sort of like we've had lithium boom, we've had uranium go bananas, we've got everyone, you know, wants to talk nickel and copper because of EVs and decarbonisation then. So what's what was the vibe from the, the whole thing? So look, everybody's pretty positive on gold. Uh, there was no negative sentiment towards gold. It was you've got to remember with miners, they very much plan ten years in advance, so they're not reactive to the price. They just try to make the most of a good price when it comes in by mining by mining weaker sections of the mine. Or sorry, a better way of phrasing that would be of mining sections that have a poorer grade in their mine when the price is high. But in general, everybody was quite positive about gold. Um, the commodities that were probably the hottest topic were copper and nickel. This is not a story that's going anywhere. And again, this is a story I've been harping on about for two years, and I know you have as well. 
um, there was a gentleman who gave an incredible presentation from EMR Capital, and he was very optimistic about copper's future, talked about, you know, the, the demand for copper is going to go up at least 40% uh, over the next decade. Uh, nickel, we're looking at demand for nickel up in the triple digits. Uh, however, the, 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 there is two hot commodities going over for the next decade, but he's uh, like the next tier down, believe it or not, he said a goal sorry, gold and uh, coking coal. Um, and he said, these are the next ones that the market is going to be really excited about. And he said, gold, obviously, for all of its uh, investment cases, hedge against inflation, you know, ca- it's a great chaos metal. He said, but for coking coal, he said, you've got to remember, we're, bu- you know, we're, we're basically um, trying to industrialize third world countries. None of that can happen without electrification and also steel. And that's where coking coal comes into it because there has been no replacement found for steel. You, like coking coal is the key ingredient in steel. Well, so hang, hang on, hang on. Let me jump in there. Iron ore is a key ingredient in steel. Don't, don't no. bag out my iron ore, Shay. Do you know what? I know you are very <laughs> passionate about iron ore and I can't believe I didn't point that out. <laughs> Naughty. <laughs> well, it's funny because I was just talking previously into the introduction that um, even with the big drawdown in iron ore, the, the iron ore miners are still very profitable. It's actually still quite high in prices. Um, oh, look, you're, you're going to catch me out here. But, I haven't looked at an iron ore stock in about six months, which is, you know. Uh, no, that, that, that's all good. That's all good. Rookie I'm just, error. I'm just saying I get the argument, but you're applying it. Well, he was applying it to coking coal, but you could make the same thing. He's probably talking about there's less supply come online for coking coal because of the issues around coal. So just to clarify, coking coal is used for steel used and for it's steel. thermal coal is the one that's burnt for electricity. Yes. So it's not thermal coal that's going to be the popular one. It's coking coal that's going to be in high demand. I will just point out, though, he actually, when he was talking about commodities is that he was excited about, I know I didn't get a mention. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he may be right. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a love child of iron ore. I'm just saying there could be opportunities there unappreciated. Right yeah. Now. But no, they, but these were the top four commodities that he, uh, you, you know, and look, I like to take 10-year forecasts with a bit of a grain of salt, uh, especially as, you know, and you weave, again, this is a conversation you, have, you and I have had at our desks over the years. The, the final metallurgy and chemistry of these EVs and all this high tech that we're using isn't really settled yet. The science is still being developed, which means that there's still plenty of opportunity for what, you know, what materials need to come in or what, you know, what we need more of or what we need less of. So a 10-year forecast- well, it also depends too on the, the deposit itself, right? Like you can have a great nickel story, but if your nickel miner has a dud deposit, well, it like, means nothing. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you have to have a whole bunch of things go right to, to, to make all that work. But when it does work, it can work really well. Absolutely. Finding it's generally the, the first thing you need to do. Well, come on. So let's talk about your studying of what's it called again? Ge- geogra- geology? Ge- geology, yeah. not geography. I was going to say geography. No, that's not right. <laughs> Geology. So is there anything that studying that that you wish you'd known when you first started following gold and mining? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, My first and foremost thing, though, is I wish more of, and this is going to sound like an absolute plug for the mining sector, so please forgive me, but it's not. I wish more of the opportunities about the mining space were talked about in high school. They very much weren't when I was growing up. And now when I look at the jobs required for the mining industry, they're quite tech driven. Uh, and I think there is an absolute knowledge gap in Australia's science based curriculum. And I really wish the science and the engineering aspect were, aspect were pushed more for me at high school. So that's probably my one dang why didn't why wasn't this brought to my attention when I was a kid a very long time ago? Um, as for understanding the gold, uh, the gold market 10 years ago, look, to be honest, I think I would have. I probably, I didn't start assessing and recommending exploration stocks until about four or five years ago. Had I had my geology background back um, even earlier, a decade ago, I would have absolutely moved into it. It was very much a confidence thing. Um, The more you understand about geology, the more comfortable you get with the risks associated with explorers, because it really is a it really is about understanding what might be in the ground and how the structures look. Because, I mean, you and I know those technical reports that miners put out, especially explorers, it, it, it's another language. Yes. So I, I do know it was a deterrent 10 years ago and I stuck more to the mid cap and to the producers because I was comfortable analysing balance sheets. I wasn't comfortable analysing geological deposits. However, now I'm much more confident working my way around an ore body, pardon the pun, um, and I, I wish I wish I had this background much earlier because I would have taken, um, I guess I could say I would have personally taken more risks when it came to investing in, in explorers. 
I was just thinking, like, on the ASX, there's so many mining stocks. You really have to get versed in this if you're going to stick around as a trader or, or investor because, I mean, just so much of it is mining. Well, as, look, as so much of Australia is mining, I mean, we're a commodity-based currency. So it's, you know, when you look at what's happening in the value of our currency and, you know, we're pretty much, what are we run by, our ASX is run by? It's run by miners, banks, and does anything else really move the ASX? Property, REITs, Property. Maybe? Oh, property rates. How many of those are even listed? Oh, I don't know. Is this something I should know? Oh, no, you're right. It's big, big banks and big miners. It's big banks and big miners. So it really is important that Australians are well versed in the mining sector. And, you know, out of the 12 million people employed in Australia, more than 1 million jobs are directly or indirectly related to the mining sector. So it's an enormous contributor to our economy. So I do think it's important for Australians to not just understand the sector and how it benefits them, uh, benefits our economy, uh, and it's largely, you know, one of the reasons it's kept us recession-free until last year, but also, too, I think it would change people's uh, investments attitude, maybe even job prospects if they understood more about our mining sector. But just to bring it back to gold, um, Greg used to talk about, I mean, Greg used to talk about this idea, this disconnect between the paper market of gold, where so you have the futures market, and then you have like the physical market. Do you guys have insight into like, is the level of demand for physical gold, those bars and coins, stagnant, growing, getting smaller? Uh, look, we are definitely seeing an increase in physical bars. And normally you would see an increase in like the smaller size bars. So sort of anything under the 10 ounces. So I think sub $30,000 and under. We are seeing uh, in particular an increase for half kilo and kilo bars from just the average investor. So, you know, not uh, Mr. and the, Mrs. The average investor worth. with a bit of money, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, the average investor with a bit of money. Um, you know, so normally we've got our beautiful 400 um, ounce bars that I absolutely love holding and they're very, very heavy, you know, but they're about a million bucks. So the average person isn't be going to be buying a million dollar hunk of gold. Uh, you know, that's a house for lack of a better way of looking at it. Um, what I am interested to see is that we are seeing more people buy those half kilos and those one kilo bars. So that's 40 grand for a half kilo and, you know, 80 to 85 for a one kilo bar. So I, I, I am surprised to see that. Um, as for a disconnect, look, yes and no. And I think this is where you need to look at the premiums of physical bars. Like the premiums will tell you if gold is in hot demand or gold or silver in hot demand, if the premiums are rising. So that's the difference between what you buy the bar at versus the spot price. Then you could, then you would argue that the physical demand is rapidly increasing uh, for gold and silver. But at the moment, I'm not seeing the premiums go up. When I talk to the sales guys, the premiums are, you know, they're, they're still pretty, fl well, not flat, but, you know, they're, they're pretty much in line with what they were earlier. Average, yeah. yeah, average. It's just, it's the size of the bars that I'm surprised that where the money's going to. Mm, that's interesting. Mm. So do you have a view then about this idea that the paper market is manipulated by bigger players and, the, you know, maybe it's the Fed funding, uh, you know, some protection team to like push it down so it's not signaling um, you know, there's this idea that gold signals trouble ahead kind of thing. And so one way is the powers that B could diffuse that is to sort of mess around with the paper market. Do you get involved with any of that sort of stuff? Look, um, I try not to. I'm fortunate that I'm, I'm getting pretty close to the institutional guys. So when you start to get a better idea, I'll say basically feel the flow of gold. Those sort of arguments don't really carry a lot of weight anymore. Um, look, at the moment, one of the things that I do like to point out is gold is up against a strong US dollar. And if the U, like gold and the US dollar have periods where they can rise in tandem, but it tends to not last long. When you've got a strong US dollar, that is going to provide a headwind for gold. Um, but what's keeping gold quite elevated? So, because, um, you know, the US dollar is quite strong. And as we get closer into talking, you know, the Fed are, uh, are we're expecting, it hasn't come out yet, but they're expecting the Fed to announce uh, quicker tapering at this um, federal uh, FMO, FOMC this week, um, that is going to give strength to the US dollar. And also to the market's very interested in seeing tightening to follow tapering. Now, if that means the, uh, the interest rate is going to go up in the Fed, that is going to create a stronger US dollar as well. So that is also going to put pressure on gold. However, what is really supporting the gold price right now is negative real rates. And that's where the inflation rate is higher than the nominal rate. So yes, we've got a strong US dollar and that is very much keeping a lid on the gold price, but supporting the gold price, you know, stopping it from falling further is very much that negative real rate. Interestingly, as you know, I heard from uh, Professor Werner recently last week, just a, a, 
a man who follows involved in finance. And he was, I've seen him publicly interviewed where he said, well, he feels that the price of gold is undervalued relative to where it should be because of the growth in the money supply around the world recently. So he views now as the time to accumulate at a cheaper price um, to where he sees where it's going. So overall, I take it you see the same thing. You just, you sort of dollar cost your way in while it's range bound, if you like, on the expectation that it, it's either portfolio insurance or, you know, a hedge against, you know, market downturns, inflation, that sort of thing. Yeah, it protects your cash, basically. Um, I completely agree. I actually do think gold is undervalued. And there is a, a wonderful blog that I follow, Charlie Morris, Atlas Pulse, and he puts out figures on uh, whether he thinks gold's undervalued or overvalued. And he actually sees gold as being undervalued as well. Uh, he has it pictured in the 1840s or 1,840 US dollars per ounce as where it should be. That's where its fair value is. However, it's trading at 1783 at the time of having this conversation. So, I, I, look, I do agree that gold is undervalued. Um, I just understand the fundamentals that are actually moving the price in each different direction. But I completely agree with your thesis that you don't buy one lump of gold and go, that's it. Off I go. Like I like to dollar cost my average, you know, a dollar cost my way in, you know, uh, I buy when it looks cheap. I buy when the Aussie dollar tends to be strong. Uh, so that way I can get, you know, the cheaper price in Aussie dollars. Cause at the end of the day, we're buying with Australian dollars, not us dollars. All right. Well now I'm going to, I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to throw a curveball at you. Okay. I'll give you some, you know, some easy stuff. So we had Ryan Dintz on last week, the crypto. Yep. Do you, how do you, if someone came to you and said, go, what am I going to buy that ancient thing? I'm going to buy Bitcoin. What do go you tell it. them? Go for it. More gold for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I believe it or not, as a uh, precious metals analyst, let's go back to that. Um, I think, believe it or not, that gold and Bitcoin can coexist. I think it is, um, look, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies are quite disruptive and we don't quite know where their potential is going. Look, Brian Dintz is incredible in this space, so I, I don't want to repeat anything that he said and I would, I, my analysis couldn't compare to his, but I do think the two could coexist. Now, I am the proud owner of $500 worth of cryptocurrencies. Um, so, you know, follow me for clearly I'm a genius when it comes to crypto. I've got four different ones. Um, and for me, it's about dabbling with a new type of money. I don't fully understand it, but I do think that it has a very important place in the future and people would be wise to investigate its potential. Uh, but but, gold- but do you, do, do, as a gold person, do you see it as digital gold or as something else? No, I don't see it as digital gold. I see it as something separate entirely. Um, I don't, I think we're in one of those really weird places where we don't know how to name the new thing. Like, you know, we've got to remember that, we call our, you know, the refrigerators used to be called an ice box because we didn't know what to call them. We just don't have a separate word for what this new thing is yet. We will find it. But no, I don't think it is digital gold. I think gold is gold and crypto is crypto. And it is okay for them to be two separate things. We don't but need to confuse Do you think them. the buyers of those assets cross over or they're very separate? Interestingly, they do cross over. And it, I recently read an article, I wish I had it on hand, that more people now own crypto in Australia than gold. So it's estimated that about 1% of Australians own some form, sorry, 2% of Australians own some form of cryptocurrency and 1% of Australians own gold. And what was more interesting in this article was the age of the people doing it. Everybody who owns gold is, you know, the average owner is 50 plus. Everybody who owns crypto, the average age is 35 and down. Yes. So I think that really really tells you about the demographic that each have. But in saying that, I believe that they can coexist. It's funny you say that, actually. So I had a conversation with Ryan and he, he presented his case for cryptocurrencies. Literally that afternoon, I spoke to an older mate of mine. He's almost 60 now and he's very wealthy, but he, he just, he's like Vern, you'll know the reference. He will not entertain the idea of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. And for him, they're just fool's, fool's gold. There you go. There's another gold reference. Do you ask him if he still rides a horse to work? Uh, I didn't. Um, because I know he drives a Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is the argument a lot of people use when it comes to gold is, oh, no, gold's been around for thousands of years as an enduring form of wealth and money. And it's like, yeah, well, it depends on what part of the, the history you're talking about because cigarettes have been money, bread's been money, you know, barter's been around for thousands of years as well. And there was a time when I remember my great-grandmother yelling at my dad because I couldn't ride a horse. Like she was mad that in the 80s I wasn't taught to ride a horse as a child when because everybody should know how to ride a horse. I'm worried about your childhood. You didn't learn about geology or mining opportunities and you didn't get to learn to ride a horse. I, I Very know, deprived. Clearly, I, do you know what? Clearly <laughs> I was too much of a city kid growing up. 
<laughs> but that's the point I'm trying to make is just because it, that's how things were 100 years ago doesn't mean that's how things are now. All right, so we're, here we are. It's 2021. Are you going to, like, put your neck on the line and forecast where gold might go next year or – is that too, just too dangerous? I mean, you've, you've copped a few hidings from gold over the years. With, oh, you know, haven't what? I? Oh, <laughs> As I, we all have. <laughs> I have had my backside handed to me more times than I care to count. Um, okay, so I think, I look, I'll, I'll come out and say this, and I said this in a couple of different places. I did think gold was going to hit 2K per ounce in US dollars at the start of this year. It didn't. Uh, and the reason it didn't is because of a strong US dollar. So I, I really didn't see the strength in the US dollar coming. So I thought that, that I got... This went the same way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of us were, were backing my thesis there, but no, that didn't happen. Um, look, uh, I still think in with rising headwinds, and the rising headwinds that I'm talking about are the strong US dollar and the Federal Reserve tapering. Now, whether that's the right decision or make, you know, we can talk central banks in another at another time, that is going to put that's really going to crimp out any rally in gold. The market is very sensitive to what the Fed is going to do next. Now, as I said, gold is being supported by, you know, these very high inflation numbers we're seeing coming out of the US. So that is certainly driving the the thesis for why people should invest in gold. But I just don't see it really having a very, very strong uh, sustaining rally in the face of a Federal Reserve Bank um, rising or and tapering next year. And saying that numbers, look, uh, look, I've got my little chart behind me. If you'll just let me do a couple of clicks. I'm confident that if we can see gold stay over 1850 in, you know, early into next year, that I, that I think we, we're going to see gold stretch its legs and make it make its way into 1900 by the end of the year. Um, it, that doesn't down, sound like a lot, but, you know, 100 bucks, 150 bucks per ounce is actually quite a bit for a hunk of metal that just sits around. <laughs> well, it's funny, isn't it, like, Okay, so you're talking about the Fed tightening. Everybody's thinking that. I mean, the market always gets us looking one way and usually does something else. So maybe they don't tighten and, and, and uh, we'll see what happens there. Look, if they don't tighten, if, like if we can take tightening completely off the table, I, I expect very strong rallies in gold. I think uh, that'll really rock the market if the Fed have gone and said they're going to do something and then they don't do something, they don't do it. I would expect very strong rallies in gold. But if the Fed stay on track, uh, and my concern is that the US market is too fragile for the Fed to surprise the market, um, then I, I think we're going to see subdued rallies in gold. But, yeah, if the Fed don't tighten, I'd say all bets are off and, you know, maybe that 2K, 2K idea comes back mid next year. Cool. All righty. So a- anyone that's listening, how do they follow what you're up to from here? Oh, look, you can uh, find me over on Twitter. You'll often see little videos of me playing with gold over there. My Twitter handle is Shay A. Russell. Uh, alternatively, you can come to the ABC Bullion website and register for our market updates under the Investor Centre. All righty, cool. All right, thank you for coming on and we'll talk again soon. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun, Callum. <laughs> Ciao.